Jaguar is going all in on electrification. Its iPACE SUV was way ahead of the curve back in 2018. Formula E is its only factory motorsport program and it plans to become a fully electric brand by 2025. It's not all bad news because you can still buy this. It's the F-Pace SVR and it's the hottest version of Jaguar's biggest and best SUV. You get a supercharged V8 engine, indulgent leather interior and a super agile chassis that's stickier than a just stop oil protester with a two for one on the super glue. Now best of all, car isn't just borrowing this one for a week, we've had it on our long term fleet for over 6,000 miles now. So that means we're not just dealing with the honeymoon period here. We can really dig in to the day to day, get down to that nitty gritty, what this car is like to live with. So if you're a hot prospect for the F-Pace SVR, here are six things I think you'll want answering. So do I have to buy the facelift? Well, the SVR came out in 2018, and when it did, we rated it really highly. But things have moved on since then, and in 2021, we got the facelift. And with that, you did get a lot of worthwhile upgrades. Under the skin, you get retuned dampers and a tweaked e-diff, plus a new steering rack, brake booster, and some suspension hardware, including different bushes. The 5-litre supercharged V8 doesn't get any extra power, but it still makes 542 brake horsepower, and there's 15 pound-foot of extra torque for 516 pound-foot all-in. There's also the tougher torque converter from the Project 8 saloon, and that actually drops the 0-60 from 4.1 to 3.8 seconds. I think the biggest reason to go for the facelift though is the new infotainment system, which we'll get onto in a minute, but don't dismiss the pre-facelift cars. I went on a well-known classified site, there's 43 of them available and they start from 50,000 uh, pounds with around 20,000 miles on. So given these cars now start from 85,000, that is really good value. So is it fast and is the MPG really terrible? Well, fast, yes it is. This is an extremely rapid car. Is the MPG terrible? Well, that depends what your expectations are. But let's start with the five litre supercharged V8. It is the zenith of Jaguar's AJ V8 engine, an all Ola unit designed by Jaguar before Ford bought the company. It used to be made at Ford's bridge end assembly plant. It's now produced in-house by JLR, and it's been the mainstay of Jaguar Land Rover performance cars for what seems like forever debuted in the XK8 of 1996, and in a marriage made in heaven, the Eaton supercharger fitted to SVR models like ours slots perfectly between the 90 degree V like a cricket ball caught by two cupped hands. In the F-Pace SVR, it makes 542 brake horsepower with 516 pound foot spread from 3,500 to 5,000 RPM. Jaguar, of course, will have plans to give this engine a send off and exactly what that will be remains to be seen we do know that this will be the last series production Jaguar Land Rover model to be fitted with the AJ V8. I think there's a tendency with this engine because it's been around for so long to kind of dismiss it as old hat, old tech, but I really like this engine. I think it's fantastic. I don't just think it's one of the great engines of our time. I think it's one of the greatest engines of all time. Starts up, it's really kind of raucous, got a load of attitude, really sort of muscle car rumble to it. And then it quietens down and, and when you're around town, it's got a kind of rich, indulgent, really kind of flexible feel to it that really suits a luxurious SUV. Now peak torque doesn't come in until 3,500 RPM, which sounds pretty high these days, but because this engine is supercharged, that is just instant response and you just feel like this car is always eager, always ready to go. And it just adds to the kind of effortless feel as you drive it around town. The other thing is, is the noise and it really brought it home to me when I was watching the new Range Rover Sport SV, which has gone to the BMW V8 engine and switched from this engine basically. And you know, it sounds like a much more digital kind of enhanced sort of engine. And it does sound like a BMW engine stuck in a Range Rover, I think, from what I've heard so far. And it just reminded me that we are really gonna miss this engine when it's gone, or I certainly am. But then you can switch it into dynamic mode on this dial here, dials up all the exhaust noise, gives you more throttle response, and also things like steering weight and so on. And I pull it back, this lever here, into, into manual mode to get control of the gear shifts, and it suddenly snaps alive and starts to feel like a much more kind of aggressive, more involving sort of car. 
<laughs> and it sends 90% of the torque to the back, by the way. So those gear shifts that were refined before and really starting to slap now, but you, you do get that sense as eight gears are all quite closely stacked. And that kind of relentless delivery is just the power just keeps on coming. So fourth into fifth. So even though the power band is relatively now it's not too bad, but you know, it stops revving, really stops pulling at what, seven two, something like that. You know, it's just this sense that it's just coming all the time and really kind of leaning back and, and firing at the horizon. So in terms of MPG, officially it's 23.1 MPG. And actually I've been getting pretty close to that with a mix of town runs, uh, motorway runs to the airport, things like that. So low 20s, 21, 22 maybe. I was pretty happy with that given my sort of driving, but then a car reader got in touch, Peter Hemming, he's bought one and he says he's getting 28 to 31 out of his at the moment, which you know he must be absolutely stroking it along, but fair play, that's really good MPG for an engine that's as exciting as this. But who knows, maybe, you know, I'm sure this will go out with some kind of tear jerking send off, maybe in an F-Base SVR, maybe some special project. Overall though, I love this powertrain. And who knows, maybe the AJ V8 will be a crate engine like a Chevy LS once Jag retires it. It's relatively light, it's compact, and it's durable too. And I wonder if you could fit one in an I-Pace. Now that would be fun. Does it handle like a Jaguar should? Well, that's another big question. This is, you know, it's an SUV, it weighs just over two tons, so it's not a sports car or a sports saloon, and that's what Jaguar really cut its teeth on and what it forged that reputation for ride and handling excellence. But I would say a lot of that Jaguar character does bubble to the surface here, and it's for a lot of different reasons. You know, it, it does ride well, I think. It's steering, you know, the front end grip, it's not, you know crazy front end grip but it's got a very very strong front end for a big heavy suv with that five liter supercharged v8 in the nose body control the way it leans into that corner but but kind of controls its mass and is predictable with it rather than getting in some nasty tank slapper i think that's really confidence inspiring as well a couple of areas where it can fall down are in town it can feel a little bit tough in town but once you're up to speed it rides really nicely it breathes unless you're on a very heavily cambered B road, which you can get in the UK, not so much here, although you can see it there rocking about a little bit. And that's because this car is coils and anti-roll bars rather than say a Range Rover Sport SVR with air springs where, you know, it can isolate that. You can use active roll control instead of anti-roll bars that are a physical connection. So, you know, cambered roads in town, it can feel a little bit tougher, but you know, generally the balance this car strikes with, you know, ride, handling, refinement, I think it's a really nice balance. So we've got 90% of the power going to the rear wheels in dynamic mode, so it's all wheel drive, 90% of the power. And if we sweep into here, you can just see how you can promote a bit of a slide. You can, you know, not in a silly way, but just to tuck it into the corner and, and make it feel like it's, it's going in the direction you want it to, but it stops short of being kind of, you know, a bit ludicrous and a bit wild like the F-Pace or the F-Type R. As much as I like that car, this is a car where you can dig into the power more and use it with more confidence. So all in, the ride, the handling, the luxury of this car, I think it works really well. The other thing is, is the steering, and, and that's really good in this car, I would say. You know, for a two-ton SUV that needs to be isolated and, and comfortable and refined, it does a really good job of keying you into the surface, of letting you know what's going on at ground level. It's nicely weighted as well. You know, it's not too light. In comfort, it is maybe a bit too light, but I've got it in dynamic here. It adds a bit of extra heft, and it just really makes you, you know, feel at the core of the action and confident to chuck what is a pretty big and tall car around and enjoy it as well. The other thing I'd say that feeds into all that kind of feel as you're driving it is the brake pedal. So that the facelift got the uh, enhanced brake booster. I think most of the time it, it works really well, but there are moments where it feels over servoed, a bit over responsive, and um, particularly at slower speeds. But if I dip into it here, just nice and firm, reassuring. And you know, overall, the way this car handles, the way it mixes, kind of really engaging handling with comfort and, and luxury. I think it works really well. 
So one of the big reasons to buy the SVR, if not the biggest reason to buy, is this new Pivi Pro infotainment system. It's a new 11.4 inch screen, looks much more modern than the system that went before, even if it could be a bit more neatly integrated into the design. So I do find it intuitive to use. You've got these three tiles that have got some of your key shortcut functions like navigation, phone, and media here. If we go into navigation, easily set your destination. We go into the radio. I've got it set to six music, but you can easily swipe through all your other stations. But touchscreens can be a bit distracting or very distracting at times. So I'm very pleased that we've got the touch control here, voice control, and um, you can you know, program your navigation through that or choose to change the radio station. And if these three tiles aren't what you need, then you can dig a little bit deeper into these functions down here. So you can see we've got things like Apple CarPlay, we've got all surface information about what the car's doing when you're off-road, and also importantly, dynamic eye. So normally you're tweaking the car's modes here, but this dynamic mode, you can shift to your own kind of personal taste. So for instance, I've got everything in dynamic except for the suspension, which I've put into the comfort mode. With the facelift and this redesign, you also get these new climate controls, which are very much like the ones in the Range Rover Velar. And what I like about these, you get the digital display. They look very modern and fresh again, but they're also, they're an analog dial. So you can feel them, they're nicely knurled. So if you're in a kind of, you know, you're getting overloaded and you're on the road, you can just turn down the temperature really quickly. They are kind of multifunctional in that you pull them out to change the fan and you push them in again to change the cooled and heated seats, which I really like as well. But when I lend this car out to people, it generally comes back with something like the heat cranked up or the blower going too much and they've got a bit mixed up. But personally, I find this quite easy to use. And the last thing you also get is this new redesigned gear shifter. Now, it's not as bad as the things in the 911 and the Golf, which are really fiddly little, uh, little gear knobs, but it's not as good as the previous pistol grip shifter, which was a little bit taller. And that's for two reasons. Now, firstly, it's because I find it a little bit slow to respond. So if you're taking it out of park and into drive, doesn't always respond and, and that's not a problem when you're moving away uh, from a parking space but when you're at the traffic lights it always discourages me from from taking it out of, of drive and putting it in park and you can't knock it over to the left to select manual and again when you're sort of on the road you want to select manual I find that really intuitive on this you have to pull it give it kind of double pull back and then check on the dash that you've got it but overall I think this is a big improvement on what went before. So which options do I need? Well, when this car was built, it's a 72 plate, it costs 81,000, 500 pounds and to that Jaguar added almost 8,000 pounds worth of options and that took the final price of this car to 89,370 pounds. But since then Jaguar has rejigged the pricing structure. So the SVR now starts from 85,180 pounds but you do get a lot more standard equipment and the net result is this car as spec costs 87,940 pounds and it's cheaper than it was before. So it depends whether you're buying your facelift SVR new or used. And 21 to 72 plate cars like ours could have a less generous specification. Kit that was previously optional and is now standard includes 22 inch alloys. They were previously 900 pounds. Gloss black exterior trim for everything from the badging to the bonnet vents that used to be 1250 pounds. The Meridian surround sound audio that was 420 pounds and the fixed panoramic roof that was 1275 pounds. This one's fixed, but there's now an optional sliding roof and that's currently 350 pounds. These performance seats are standard now, but they come with suede cloth inserts, but you still have to pay £1,100 extra to get them in semi-aniline leather like ours. Head-up display is also still optional, that's £830. Now I've got an extremely active lifestyle. I go base jumping, a free solo, any rock face I can find in the East Midlands, but I also like the inflatables at Rutland Aqua Park. The last time I was there, I used this really useful option. Actually, it's 325 pounds at the moment. It's the activity key. What it means is you can lock away your key in the glove box or even leave it at home, lock your valuables inside the car and then just jump in the water. You don't have to worry about putting the key in a changing room or something. So if you've got an active lifestyle like me, you might want to consider the activity key. How does it compare with rivals? Well, that is the big one, isn't it? Should you buy this car versus rivals? But when I first group tested the F-Base SVR, when it came out 2021, we had three other cars and I did put it in first position. So we had the X6M, 
BMW and we also had the Audi RS Q8. Now those were the most comparable cars to the F-Pace, but they're about 50 brake horsepower, more powerful, they're a lot heavier, and also they were well over 100,000 pounds as well. The other car in that group test was the KN Coupe S. Now that was more comparable on price, but that made 470 brake horsepower, so it was a good bit down on, on the F-Pace SVR, so it was actually quite shrewdly positioned. Now the F-Pace is about 77 millimeters shorter, I think, than the KN, but its wheelbase is only 21 millimeters shorter. So when you look in the back, there's actually plenty of space. I've got a couple of teenage kids, they're fine back there. And also the boot is more spacious than the KN as well. So I think all round, as an all round package, performance, price, practicality, actually it stacks up really well. The other thing I did was I, I did a job with this car recently for, for Car Magazine. I went to visit a Jaguar collector who, who, let's face it, had an awful lot of money. And he'd actually dismissed a Range Rover Sport SBR, not because it's a bit yobby, which I do think it's yobbier than this car, but because he just thought it was too much money, even though he had the funds to buy it. But when I let him drive this, he really, really liked it. He thought he may well buy it, and he thought it was good value in the context of this market as well. So there you have it, over 6,000 highly contented miles in the Jaguar F-Pace SVR. I like the engine, like the handling, the design, and I like the refinement of this car. I also like the fact you're unlikely to see another, which can't be said for its sibling, the Range Rover SVR. I've seen one other F-Pace SVR and I was so surprised I actually stopped to video it. Nothing has gone wrong during our time with this car, I still enjoy driving it very much, that all those miles have turned up a few flaws I didn't notice on first acquaintance. But two years since I first tested it against the German opposition, I'd still take the Jaguar F-Pace SVR over them all.